DraftKings, I knew you were up to something. Let's discuss. Welcome back to Bray Birds DFS, one of the best places for PGA, NFL, MLB, and NBA news, and of course, DFS. If you don't know by now, I'm Walt. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to my channel. So I told y'all that DraftKings had something up their sleeve. <clears throat> and I don't know whether this is just like a one day thing. They've been slowly trying to push this out or if this is the new normal, but there is non late swap only today. So first DraftKings started like splitting up the main slate and the night slate so they wouldn't overlap. So I guess if there's any bit of good news is the difference between the start time of the first game and the last game is only an hour. But when you're dealing with questionable players, I mean, that makes a big difference. So I would assume that you all will probably be finalizing your lineups between 6 and 6.50 uh, Eastern time. So when you're making those early lineups, maybe earlier in the day before you finalize, you definitely want to probably put the most risky, questionable player in the utility spot. And then your second tier kind of risky players in center, guard or forward. And then the players that you're really locked in on in point guard, you know, shooting guard small forward and power forward because you're going to have to make some tough decisions in some cases over an hour before the start time of those eight o'clock games so if you're someone that is you know not risk averse uh you know and you want to be risky basically what i'm getting at you can put some questionable players you know into your lineup from eight o'clock and they're they're probably going to be players that other people would shy away from but just know that <clears throat> without a late swap really could get bit in the bottom of that. All right, so let's look back at the slate last night, and it was very interesting. We did have a super stud that made the winning GPP lineup. Uh, the value in mid-range kind of flipped. We only had two mid-range, and we had five values, and for the second day in a row, we didn't have any studs, and for the second day in a row, we did not have any super value players. The good picks that I recommended were Wimby, he went off, and also O'Neal. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do is I like to put all the players into one of five tiers. We just talked about it. We have the super studs over 10,000, the studs 8,000 to 10,000, the mid range 6,000 to 8,000, the value players 4,000 to 6,000, and the super value players under 4,000. Once I have all those players into tiers, I look at the five variables you see on the screen, starting with how they've been playing the past seven to 10 days. I like to get a good gauge of that because I need players that are gonna be consistent if I'm gonna recommend them for your lineup. The same things go for minutes and variance. I just need those players that aren't just like, you know, maybe there was an overtime game or a suspension or something like that. I don't need all of that. The main thing I really like to look at are the teams and matchups. And we can look at the screen and we can see the good offenses today are the Pacers and the Celtics. Pacers are the number one offense uh, in the NBA and the Celtics are number four. And then I like to just keep track of those good defenses. Doesn't mean I'm going to fade those players, but I got to know what I'm getting myself into. So you have the T-Wolves at number one, the Cavs number two, and the Celtics at number five. But my favorite slide, those bad defenses. I love to exploit those bad defenses. Pacers are the third worst defense and the Pistons are the fourth worst defense. So who are those matchups to watch? So we have the Pacers going to New Orleans. Those are two pretty good offenses and one really bad defense. And then we have the blowout alert. We know the pros and cons of blowouts. We can expand, you know, the bench. We can expand, which expands the value and super value. But we know a con is that there could be a blowout that is so bad that they pull the starters early. So the blowout alert is, um, you know, Charlotte going to Philadelphia. Philadelphia are 11 and a half point favorites. And then once again, this is very important. The final thing I look at are injuries and rest. And with no late swap, this has become basically critical. All right, so let's look at the super studs. And there are only two to choose from. And I am going to choose Luca. He's questionable at this point, obviously. <laughs> Got a little bit more risk now. But um, assuming he's not questionable questionable but you know how they do sometimes this is definitely a matchup that he is going to get up for and going to want to play well against uh the celtics we need him to get at least 60 to 61 points he's done that in three out of the last five games and when he surpasses his value total he zooms past it as we can see his results against toronto against cleveland and against the suns 
Let's move on to the studs. And Scotty Barnes has been playing really well today. I mean, recently, excuse me, and he has a great matchup today. We need him to get at least 47 fantasy points, and he's done that in three out of the last five games. The other stud I like is Tyrese Maxey. From a DFS perspective, Embiid not being there has just been great for him. Obviously not in real life. At 8,700, we need him to get about 43 fantasy points, and he's done that in five out of the last five games, and he's in that matchup of the day. Then we have Jalen Brown, who has been playing better over the last month or so. At 7,600, we need him to get at least 36 fantasy points, and he's done that in three straight games and three out of the last five games. Let's move to the mid-range, and we have Duran at 6,900. Uh, he has a tough matchup today, but I still like him because of how he's been playing and his consistency. We need him to get at least 34 to 35 fantasy points, and he's done that in three straight games, including three straight games of 40 fantasy points or greater. And then Karis LeVert. So, yes, I mean, he's playing a great match. He's playing Detroit. Yes, I don't think he's going to get 55 points every day. He's not going to get 47 points. But the fact that you have someone in the second unit at 5,400 who has that ceiling is just someone that you have to consider on the six-game slate. And then we go to Jordan Goodwin at 4,700. We know the Memphis Grizzlies are struggling. Uh, when he starts, he gets at least a fantasy point per minute in general. So we're assuming he's going to start today. So at 4,700, we need him to get at least 23 fantasy points. And he's done that in two out of the last three games where he started. <clears throat> I mean, then we have a car row. So, I mean, we have to respect the fact that we have someone under 4,000 who gets minutes this consistent and actually turns around those minutes to almost a fantasy point per minute and then we're going to finish with trey jemison because we actually have someone that is projected to start today that is only 3300 he's in the eight o'clock game i mean <laughs> i don't know what to tell you but when he's on the court he averages a little less than a fantasy point per minute all right so check out my recap let me know if you have any questions feel you know, please feel free to leave comments, but otherwise go out there and win that guap. I hope that video helped you with your lineups. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe and hit that notification bell. All those things are free and I'll talk to you next time.